Surah Al-Mujadala is the 58th surah of the Qur'an. It's a very different surah of the Qur'an because it deals with, in its first four ayat, an incident that occurred in the Prophet's life, Ali wasalam. In Allah's wisdom, he decided that this story should be remembered until Judgment Day. And these four ayat are dedicated to this one conversation that the Prophet Ali wasalam, had with a woman who's otherwise not very famous at all. She had a problem with her husband and she wanted to discuss this problem with the Prophet So I'm going to explain some of that to you in the course of this khutbah. But because of this conversation and she was complaining about something and the Prophet So did not have an answer for her question. Allah had not revealed an answer to him yet. She complained, instead of complaining to the Prophet So after arguing with him, she complained to Allah. And Allah revealed Quran because of her. And years later, after the Prophet ﷺ had passed away, one time, Umar bin al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, who was the head of state, you can think of it in today's terms, he was the president. And he was traveling with an entourage with a security detail. Nowadays, you know how sometimes when the president travels, they have a motorcade, and they have like, you know, a security detail, and they've got important personnel with them in multiple cars, and there's like a train of cars going through. And they have, of course, a short deadline, they have to get somewhere. So Umar bin al-Khattab was meeting with a bunch of delegates from different parts, in Quraysh, etc. And she happened to be passing down the street. Years later, this is after the Prophet ﷺ passed away. And she was passing down the street and she said, Ya Umar! She just called him, Umar! And Umar stopped the caravan, stopped the entourage, and the, you know, the official government trip. He got off his horse, he went down and he started talking to her. And she starts yelling at him. And she says to him, I knew you when they used to call you Umar. In other words, Umar means little Umar. She goes, I remember you since you were little. And then she's giving him like, you should fear Allah. Now you're a big shot, huh? Now you're head of state. You're the Amir al-Mu'mineen. Look at you now. Always fear Allah. Always remember Allah. And she talks to him for a good hour. She's giving him a lecture on the street right there. And all his crew, his security, all the other ambassadors that are waiting, they're just standing there waiting until he's done. And he doesn't say a word. And when she's done, then she leaves. And then he says, we can go. And some of his staff came to him and said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen. We haven't seen a day like this one. I've never seen something like this. What, you stopped all of this? All of these VIPs? Bil'ajuz, this old lady, that's why you stopped? And he said, this woman, when she complained, her complaint was heard above seven heavens. And Allah revealed Quran for this woman. If she talked to me all night, I would have been standing here. If she kept me the next day, I would have been standing here. The only time I would have left is if she gave me the excuse to go pray. That's the only time I would have left. But otherwise, how am I not going to listen to someone who is heard above the seven heavens? And Quran comes down for her. Her name was Khawla radiallahu anha. She had this honor of her memory being part of the Quran that we recite. Just kind of give you an appreciation of how the people before us used to appreciate this wonderful woman. She comes to the Prophet ﷺ complaining. And when she talks to him, she says a bunch of things about her husband. She says, he's an old man, he doesn't have good manners. That's how she starts. She's younger than him, but she's not that young. So she says, I used to be able to have children, but now that I can't have kids anymore, he thinks I'm worthless and he treats me like a servant. And she even goes on to say another narration of the same story. I used to be young and a lot of men wanted to marry me, but I chose him. And look at how he treats me. And today he came home, he was upset. I responded to him, and when I answered back, he gave me some sharp comment. I gave him a sharper comment back. Some of you married men know what that's like. You open your mouth, you say something smart, and you get 10 times worse back. She snapped back at him, and he got so upset, he said to me, from today on, you are like my mother. That's what he said to her. From today, you are like my mother. And this was in Arab tradition before Islam. This was called dihar. And dihar was this ugly practice where when you're really mad at your wife, you say, from today, I swear, you're like my mom. And that means I will never have any kind of relationship with you again because I think of you like my mother now. It's impossible for you and me to be together. And that means they can never be together. So this is like way even worse than divorce. And this was something they used to say before Islam. So he said that to her and then he left. She says he was with his friends for an hour or whatever and then he came back and he wanted to come close to me and I said, no, you're not coming close to me until Allah and his messenger make a decision because you said what you said. I'm not going to let you touch me ever again until I talk to the Prophet So she comes to the Prophet and she says that's what he said. 
What should we do? And the Prophet ﷺ first said, I have no revelation to answer this. Quran talks about divorce, talaq. It doesn't talk about from today, you're my mother. It doesn't address that problem. Not yet anyway. So the Prophet ﷺ doesn't have an answer for her. But based on what the Prophet ﷺ can tell, he on his own opinion said to this woman, from as far as I can see, harumti alayhi, you're, you become haram for him. You can no longer be with him. I don't say I know the answer, but this is just my opinion. The Prophet ﷺ didn't give a fatwa on her. He said, this is what I think. And she says, ma qala talaqan. She said, but he didn't say divorce. So she starts arguing back with the Prophet ﷺ. The witnesses to this account say that she was going back and forth and she was actually getting more and more upset with the Messenger of Allah wasallam. And as she was getting loud, you know, nobody comes and talks to the Prophet like that wasallam. In other places in the Quran, in Surah Al-Hujurat, we learn that if you raise your voice above the Prophet's voice, or you call him like you call anybody else, وَلَا تَجْهَرُوا لَهُ بِالْقَوْلِ كَجَهْرِ بَعْضِكُمْ لِبَعْضِ أَن تَحْبَطَ أَعْمَالُكُمْ وَأَنْتُمْ لَا تَشْعُرُونَ If you call on the Prophet وسلم, like you talk about anybody else, you call anybody else. If I see one of my friends, I say, hey bro, come here. Hey Kareem, come here. But if somebody came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, Hey Muhammad, we want to talk to you. If you even did that, what does Allah say? Don't you dare talk to him that way. Because all of your good deeds will be taken away. It doesn't matter if you were fighting the battle of Badr, or you made hijrah, or you spent all of your money in charity. All of that will be gone because you talked to the Prophet like that. Because you were casual with the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. But this woman is raising her voice. And she's arguing with him. She's debating with him, going back and forth. Understand something. Sometimes the Prophet ﷺ wasn't even saying something from revelation. He was giving his opinion sometimes. There were some people that used to garden. And they were experienced in gardening and farming. And they have certain ways that they grow their plants. And the Prophet ﷺ was passing by. He said, why do you do that? I said, Ya Rasulullah, this is how we grow the plants. He goes, that doesn't make any sense to me. And he just kind of criticized it. But he, he's not a gardener. He's not a farmer. He just said it. And they stopped growing their plants that way. And the next year, the crop didn't grow. And they came to the Prophet and said, Ya Rasulullah, you said, why do you do that? He said, I didn't tell you not to do that. Antum a'lamu bi umuri dunyakum. You know better about your place. In other words, when the Prophet even says something once, a little bit, nobody argues back. They just do it. Even if he wasn't telling them to do it. And in this case, this woman, even though she hears the Prophet opinion, she says, but no, he didn't pronounce divorce. I don't understand this answer. When the Prophet ﷺ didn't have an answer that she wanted, and she, she tried to explain to him, we have children. And then she says that if I leave these children with him, da'u, they're gonna die. He doesn't know how to take care of kids. He's horrible with children. He's got a temper with me, but he's also horrible with children. He can't take care of them. And if I can't ever be with him again, and the kids are in the house, these kids are as good as dead. And then she says, but if I keep the children with me, ja'u, they're gonna starve to death. I don't have a means to provide for them. We can't break this family. This is the problem she presents to the Prophet ﷺ. And he doesn't have an answer. And Allah then revealed these four ayat. Because there's some things in here that we have to take with us forever. Like Allah decided that this story should be part of what we recite until Judgment Day for a reason. There are some timeless, timeless lessons here that everybody needs to remember. And that's why Allah made us remember this story. Allah opens by saying قَدْ سَمِعَ اللَّهُ قَوْلَ الَّتِي تُجَادِلُكَ فِي زَوْجِهَا Allah has been listening, has already heard the word of the woman who comes and argues with you about her husband. So Qur'an didn't come down to tell this woman fear Allah and show respect to the Prophet. Watch yourself. This is the Messenger of Allah. You know like other places وَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ فِيكُمْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ you better know this is the messenger of Allah among you. Not this time. Allah says, Allah has been listening to the word of the one who's arguing with you about her husband. A point came where she got so frustrated with the Prophet ﷺ. She put her hands and head in the sky and she said, Ya Allah, put some words in your Prophet's mouth. <laughs> That's what she said. Put some words in your Prophet's mouth because he doesn't have an answer for me. And Allah revealed this and the Prophet started speaking started reciting this Qur'an. And he says, Allah has heard the speech, the complaint, the words of the one complaining to you about her husband. And she's turning to Allah, وَتَشْتَكِي إِلَى Allah, And she's taking her complaint to Allah. وَاللَّهُ يَسْمَعُ تَحَاوُرَكُمَا And Allah has been listening all along to the dialogue the two of you are having. It's not just the people standing around the Prophet ﷺ in shock, how is this woman talking this way? Even the people are listening. And Allah says, I've been listening to this dialogue. 
إن الله سميع بصير. Certainly, Allah is all hearing and the one who sees. Now, the first lesson we learn here from Allah Himself is that when someone is in trouble and when someone is in a desperate situation and they come to you asking for help. Even if they're raising their voice or they're debating with you because they're in a terrible situation, you're not supposed to get upset. How dare do you speak to me this way? Show some respect. If Allah Azza wa Jal even completely overlooked the fact that one of the believers is debating with Allah's Messenger, this is the same Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam about whom Allah said previously, "Am turiduna an tas'alu rasulakum kama su'ila Musa min qablu wa man yatabaddal al-kufra bil iman faqad dalla sawa' as-sabil." In Al-Baqarah he said, "Are you going to question your messenger like the people before you questioned their messengers?" And whoever does that, how does he say, "Wa man yatabaddal al-kufra bil iman?" Whoever replaces their faith with not believing at all, with disbelief, has gone off the far end, meaning they're misguided, they're lost. Questioning your messenger is like being misguided. Is leaving Islam altogether. Isn't she questioning? She's questioning, she's debating. But Allah gave us an exception. When someone is in despair, when someone is hurting, and they come seeking relief, then Allah Azza wa Jal is merciful towards them, and He doesn't treat them the same way He would treat someone else who's just being arrogant and obnoxious. In other words, when we deal with people, sometimes people get upset. But before you say, how dare you get upset, the first lesson here is, first understand, is this upset because they're arrogant? Is this upset because they're just full of themselves? Or is this upset coming from pain? Are they in some kind of pain or difficulty that's making them cry out? That's making them upset? And if that's the case, you have to overlook the raising of the voice. You have to overlook the, the tone. And you have to be sympathetic to the pain. And the difficulty that they're in, Allah overlooked the fact that she's debating with his own messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he says, I heard her call, I heard her complaining with you, and I've heard the entire dialogue. Anybody else standing there, sitting there would have been like, how did you talk like that? And Allah says, yes, I've heard the whole thing. I've heard all of it. And now Allah's response, he says, الَّذِينَ يُظَاهِرُونَ مِن نِسَائِهِمْ مِنْكُمْ مِن نِسَائِهِمْ Those of you that are going to say such a thing to their women, to their wives, if you ever say something like that, you're like my mother. First thing Allah says, مَا هُنَّ أُمَّهَاتِهِمْ They're not their moms. They are not their mothers. إِنْ أُمَّهَاتُهُمْ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَلَدْنَهُمْ Their mothers are the ones that gave them birth. Now that's not rocket science. Everybody already knows that's your mom, the one who gave you birth. And the people who said it also knew that. But the fact that Allah went out of His way to say, by the way, those of you who say such nonsense, that it makes no sense, number one. And first of all, you already have a mother, the one who gave you birth. This is Allah's way of scolding, not the woman, but the men who said something arrogant. Because they felt, I'm in a bad mood, I'm just going to say what I'm going to say. And they're just going to just run their mouth. And Allah came at them and said, they're not their And then He didn't stop there. He says, وَإِنَّهُمْ لَيَقُولُونَ مُنْكَرًا مِنَ الْقَوْلِ وَزُورًا and they are saying something vile, something disgusting, something unacceptable. This is an unacceptable kind of speech, and this is false testimony. Allah is offended by this because there's lots of reasons, but I'll, I'll share a couple of them with you. Allah has made certain things sacred, and one of the things that's sacred is the mother. وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ الَّذِي تَسَاءَلُونَ بِهِ وَالْأَرْحَامِ be conscious of Allah and be conscious of the womb of the mother. Motherhood is sacred. So anytime the word mother is used in a dirty way, or in a way to make an argument, or in a way for somebody to use foul language, then they have not committed a crime against someone else that they cussed out, or someone they called their mother, or etc, etc. They have committed a crime against Allah because the womb of the mother is sacred. How dare you use the word mother that way? How dare you? That's what Allah is, Allah is saying. Now, I don't have to make a list. Y'all live in America, and people that are watching on the internet know what the internet is like. Virtually in every culture in the world, shaitan is the same shaitan. The shaitan speaks Japanese, and the shaitan speaks Punjabi, and the shaitan speaks English. It's the same shaitan. The food can be different, and the cultures can be different. The devil's the same. And the devil knows that Allah made the womb sacred. This is why you find in virtually every language, one of the most abused words is mother. One of the most abused words is mother. In every culture. 
Why is that? The cultures are different. Their filth should be different too. No, it's the same. Because the devil's the same. Because shaitan is the same. And by the way, the one who doesn't have regard for the womb of the mother has no regard for Allah. Has no regard for Allah. Allah Azza wa Jal made this word motherhood. It comes from the womb, which is Raham. And in a hadith Qudsi, he said, Sammaituka bismi. I named you the womb with my own name, Ar Rahman. So be careful when you say something like that. But Alhamdulillah, we don't say that anymore. I don't know of any crazy case where somebody had an argument with their wife and said, You're my mom from now. Nobody does that anymore. It's dead. It's been gone for 1400 years. What else we have to learn from this? This person made haram for himself, forbidden for himself, something Allah allowed. This relationship between husband and wife is also sacred. Just like motherhood is sacred, marriage is also sacred. And marriage is something Allah calls me thaqan ghalila, a heavy contract, a heavy agreement. This heavy agreement that he describes in the Quran is the same wording he uses when prophets made an agreement with God that they will deliver his message. That's also mithaqan ghalila. And in Surah An-Nisa, he says about marriage, وَأَخَذْنَ مِنْكُمْ مِيثَاقًا غَلِيظًا It is a very heavy agreement. Don't take it lightly. In these particular sets of ayat, Allah is especially hard on men. Because you know, an argument is two-way street. When a man says something crazy, it's not like he was just sitting around one day and he decided to say something crazy. Some men are like that. But a lot of times, the women are saying some crazy things too. And they're poking and they're poking and they're poking and eventually he just loses it and says something crazy. But in this particular ayah, Allah is holding men responsible. You better watch your tongues. You're the head of the household. You're supposed to have more self-control. You can't lose it. And if you lose it, you better watch your tongues still. You don't get to cross a line. So then after Allah says, okay, those of you who have done this, يَعُودُونَ لِمَا قَالُوا And they want to go back from what they said. They want to take it back. I'm sorry, I didn't mean it. I want to take it back. In any other deed, you just make tawbah and you move on with life. That's it. Easy. But here Allah said, no, that's not enough. فَتَحْرِيرُ رَقَبَةٍ You have to free a slave. You have to free a slave. مِنْ قَبْلِ أَنْ يَتَمَاسَ Before they can touch each other. I just called her like she's like my mother. I didn't mean it. I was just mad. No, that's not good enough. You have to go free a slave. Why free a slave? Some scholars talk about why free a slave. Because when you said that to a woman, you put her in a kind of emotional prison. She's not quite your wife anymore. She's not quite free and divorced anymore. And you created a misery for her. And to make up for that, Allah says, now to give you an idea of the kind of misery you put her in, you have to take someone that is in actual misery, in the misery of slavery, and you have to free them. So you get some appreciation of the pain you caused. The penalty fits the crime. That's in Allah's law. So he says, go free a slave before they can touch each other. That's the advice you're being given. Allah knows what you're up to. Then he says, and whoever can't do that, okay, somebody can't afford to free a slave. What do I do now? And by the way, nowadays if something like this happened, we don't have slaves around, so what are we going to do? So he says, فَمَنْ لَمْ يَجِدْ فَصِيَامُ شَهْرَيْنِ مُتَتَابِعَيْنِ مِنْ قَبْلِ أَنْ يَتَمَاسَ They have to fast, listen to this carefully now, that man has to fast 60, 60 consecutive days, two consecutive months, before they can touch each other. You know, in Ramadan when you fast, You can be intimate with your spouse in the night of the fast. Not these fasts, they're not 30 days of Ramadan. People are like, Alhamdulillah, it's over. This is Ramadan times two. And let me tell you something. In Ramadan, Allah makes the fasting easy. Try fasting 30 days of Ramadan, then try fasting two days after that. It's 10 times harder. Because you read Allah bikumul yusr. Allah wants ease for you in Ramadan. He makes it easy. It's way harder outside of Ramadan. And Allah says now 60 consecutive days. And what that means is if you miss one day, like 45 days, 46 day, you missed it or you couldn't do it. Guess what? the counter resets back to one again. And then 60. Get to 60 consecutive before they can touch each other. If it was just 60 days, any 60 days. But shahrayni mutatabi'aini, 60 consecutive days, two consecutive months before they can touch each other. How in the world is he going to do that? And then he says, and whoever can't do that, فَإِتْعَامُوا سِتِّينَ مِسْكِينًا Just like in any other parts of Sharia, when you miss a fast, then you can make it up by feeding somebody. You have to feed 60 people. 
But the question is, why fasting? When you fast, when I fast, then things that are halal for me usually become haram. Right? Water is halal, it becomes haram. Food is halal, it becomes haram. The wife is halal, she becomes haram when I'm fasting. Isn't that the case? Allah says, you opened your mouth and you took something halal and you decided to make it haram. Let me teach you who makes halal and haram. You're going to learn for 60 days who makes halal and haram because you forgot when you opened your mouth like that. You forgot. So he says, fast for 60 days. In that story, when the ayat came down, the lady didn't stop. Khawla said, he doesn't have money to free a slave. And he said, well, he could fast for 60 days. She said, he can't even do one day. When he misses one meal, he starts going blind. So he can't do. And then he said, okay, well, he can feed 60. And she said, we don't know. We barely have food ourselves. Who's he going to give to? So the Prophet ﷺ then brought a basket of dates and said, here, go give it to 60 people. <laughs> and and the, the leftovers, take them home. <laughs> That's what he did for her. People say things in anger in life. You know what some people do that say abusive things in anger? Then, two hours later, they pretend like it never happened. But you're the worst thing that ever happened to me. I can't believe I have lived with you. I used to be happy before I met you. You're the reason I'm sick. You're the reason everything's gone bad, etc, etc. Cetera, et cetera. I hate you so much. You're the worst mistake of my life. And then two hours later, hey, you want to go for ice cream? Hey, what are we doing tonight? Hey, did you get the tickets yet? Acting totally normal like that didn't happen. And you're like, uh, so should I pretend to be normal too? Because you have to make a calculation in your head. Should I remind them of the crazy things they were saying two hours ago? Because that was really exhausting. Should I exhaust myself all over again? Because they seem to have amnesia. Right? They forgot all about it. And so you say to yourself, man, that's too exhausting. Let's just go get ice cream. So, <laughs> so you just go along. You go along. And this is, what, this is a game some people play. They're abusive. And then they pretend it never happened. Then they're verbally abusive, and then they pretend it never happened. And then they're verbally abusive, and they pretend it never happened. And you keep playing that game along with them. Because it's too tiring to keep on arguing it. It's like being in a boxing match, and you're like, finally it's over. And then the bell rings again, and he's standing right there again. And like, okay, I throw in the towel. I say, you win. I can't argue this anymore. Some people do that. This man and this woman could have just had this argument, and a couple of hours later, he wanted to be with her, yes? He just wanted to be with her. Like, let's pretend it never happened. You can do that. You can do that until judgment day. But Allah will remind you that these words that you said are not light. Verbal abuse inside of a family is not light. Saying these things that are absolutely haram to say. Sometimes mothers get dramatic because they watch too much soap operas or, or Pakistani dramas or whatever. From today, you are no longer my son. Or I never want to see your face again. Not until I die. And then they throw in, I swear by Allah, and this and that, oh my God. And you think these words that you say, they don't have any consequences? They're not being recorded? Allah didn't hear this conversation that happened inside of a bedroom? And revealed ayat about it? Because when you get to pretend that you never said it, and that you made the other person force amnesia on the other person also, Allah doesn't forget. Allah will hold to account. And Allah's verdict on especially taking family relationships and making verbal abuse okay inside family relationships is very harsh. It's not a small thing. There's a reason four ayat like that came down. That's a pretty big thing. This is what happened in another time of the Prophet's life. This is important to connect. You know in Ramadan you're not supposed to be with your wife when you're fasting. A companion came to the Prophet ﷺ, he said, I, I've killed myself, I've destroyed myself. What happened? I was with my wife. Well, in Ramadan. What should I do? And no Qur'an has come. The Qur'an never tells you what you should do if that happens. But this man came and said, I had intimacy with my wife. What should I do in Ramadan? And the Prophet ﷺ said, free a slave. Where am I going to find a slave? And I, I can't afford to. He said, fast 60 days. He says, I couldn't handle Ramadan. I can't, how am I going to fast 60 days? And he says, feed 60 people. He said, I don't know, between these two mountains, there's no one poorer than my family. If you know one, son, let me know. And then the Prophet ﷺ gave him, again, baskets of food, and said, go give this to people. And he says, the leftover, can I keep? He says, yeah, you can keep it, go. But what the Prophet ﷺ gave him is three answers. Free a slave, fast 60 days, or feed 60 people, yes? 
which is exactly what he said in Surah Al-Mujadala, Allah said, why did the Prophet take the revelation of Surah Al-Mujadala, which is about men calling their wives your mother? And he applied it to a completely different situation. I was asking one of my teachers, Dr. Akram Nadwi, about that, and his answer was brilliant. He said, both of these have something in common. When you take something that is haram, and you purposely made it halal for yourself, then it's the same rule. And when you take something halal, the wife, and you make her haram for yourself, same violation. Only Allah decides what's halal, only Allah decides what's haram. When you take that in your own hand, you better make up for it. That's what these two have in common. This is not a small thing. We have to be careful about the things we say and do. And words inside of a home are not, not being recorded by Allah. They're being very carefully recorded by Allah. The word of this woman, not even when she came to argue with the Prophet ﷺ, from way back when. All of her arguments with her husband, all of them are recorded. All of them are with Allah. So be mindful, especially, especially with the way you speak to people in your family. Especially with them. We are the nicest when we meet strangers. Assalamu alaikum, how are you? MashaAllah, alhamdulillah. Then you get in the car with your wife and kids. Or your husband. Or your siblings. And you're like, the face changes. The tone changes. The words change. The attitude changes. The Prophet ﷺ says, the best of you are the best to your families. Most of us are the worst to our families. We're the best to everybody else. We look great to everybody else. We're the worst to our own families. Worst to our own spouses. Husbands to wives, wives to husbands. This is how we have forgotten Allah's book. I pray that this khutbah is a reminder for myself and for all of you to be careful with how we use our tongues in the context of our homes.